DBT, or Dialectical Behavior Therapy, was developed by Dr. Marsha Linehan in the late 1970s to help those who were chronically suicidal and those who were suffering from one of the worst forms of mental illness, borderline personality disorder. DBT's application has since been expanded to help those who were suffering from other problems such as depression, anxiety, and eating disorders, which can both be separate psychological problems or symptoms of BPD. DBT's clinical use has grown over the years, especially since it has now been given the label evidence-based because of all the research studies that have been conducted that prove it works. And in fact, it is the only therapeutic approach that has been scientifically proven to help with BPD. Drugs can be used with the various elements of BPD, such as depression and anxiety, but they do not really help to cure BPD, but merely manage some of the more intolerable symptoms. In this video, we will be focusing on mindfulness training. This is probably the most important skill taught in DBT and is the backbone of the program and is deeply implicated in the other three modules. And although it was introduced to Western psychology and therapeutic practices by molecular biologist and professor of medicine, Dr. John Kabat-Zinn, who learned about it through his studies of Buddhism, it was not a Buddhist invention, but was merely systematized and given central prominence by the Buddha, being the seventh spoke of their eightfold path. Mindfulness can actually be found in all of the major religions, such as Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and Hinduism, and it extends well beyond any kind of religious or spiritual training and is also taught indirectly in all martial arts and any activity or occupation where they need to maintain a heightened state of awareness and harness the power of attention. So this would include police officers and border guards. What Dr. John Kabat-Zinn did was to secularize it and strip it of its spiritual and religious elements and turn it into a sound therapeutic tool that nearly 40 years later has a substantial body of growing scientific evidence to back up the claims it is a profound healing tool. Mindfulness is now an evidence-based therapy that has been proven to reduce depression and anxiety, help hospital and cancer patients deal with chronic pain, enhance our ability to tolerate distress, and increase our ability to relax. And as a result, it is now the most important skill taught in DBT. Dr. John Kabat-Zinn's definition is, mindfulness is the awareness that emerges through paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally to the unfolding of experience moment by moment. He also says that mindfulness involves the ability to be aware of your thoughts, emotions, physical sensations and actions in the present moment without judging or criticizing yourself or your experience. And Marsha Linehan defines it as intentionally living with awareness in the present moment without judging or rejecting the moment without attachment to the moment. They are both descriptive ways of saying what mystics have been saying for ages. Be here now. In other words, to be mindful is to bring your awareness into the present moment and be present to this moment. So becoming aware of your breath and your breathing is an act of mindfulness. Becoming aware of the sounds and images you can see and hear in the present moment is also an act of mindfulness. So is becoming aware of how you are feeling right now, here in this moment. You can even be mindful of the self-talk and the words and pictures in your mind. The thing about mindfulness is that although it focuses on the now, it is done moment by moment, so that you can be mindful of the sound of these words and mindful of the air flowing through your nose 
and then mindful of the sensation of the bottom of your feet, and then mindful of the touch of clothing on your skin. This brings us to another definition, one that more closely mirrors the one that the Buddha would have used. This is because the Buddhist term for mindfulness is sati, which has alternately been translated as attention and remembrance. So mindfulness is not this mysterious skill you have to learn because you already know how to do it and have done it millions of times in your life. Perhaps when you stopped and were caught up by the beauty of an incredible sunset or the time you focused on inhaling the scent of a rose or when your attention was repeatedly drawn to a sprained ankle every time you took a step. And this brings us to the third term, remembrance. This is because it also involves remembering to be mindful and remembering to bring our attention back into this present moment and remembering to pay attention to what is going on here and now. Of course, it is possible to get overwhelmed if you try to be too mindful of too much, though it is still very much a skill and with any skill our prowess can grow. This was why the Buddha instructed his students to simply start by becoming aware of the air as it flows in and out of their nostrils. And then when they had mastered this, or at least been able to be mindful of this sensation for longer and longer periods, to then become aware or mindful of the air as it flows into the lungs and then back out again, and then to become mindful and aware of the whole body breathing, and then the posture of the body, developing the skill baby step by baby step. Dr. John Kabat-Zinn even said that mindfulness was like a muscle, and the more we exercise this muscle, the stronger it grows and the more it can lift. Now, as we mentioned, this is an innate skill that all humans possess. And the hardest part about being mindful is remembering to do so and remembering to bring our awareness and attention back to this present moment. And since we can see, hear, smell, taste, and touch, we can be mindful of one or even all of our senses. We can also experience emotions such as feeling happy or sad so we can become aware of how we are feeling. We can also think both in words and pictures so that we can think the word cat and even imagine the three letters that make up this word or even summon up an image of a cat. And if we do so with the awareness of being here and now in this moment, this too is a form of mindfulness. There are three other key points. Firstly, both Kabat-Zinn and Linehan also used the word non-judgmental. And this means that it does not involve criticism or judgment. So to be mindful of a sunset is not to compare it to other sunsets or to rate it on a scale of one to 10, but simply to be aware of it, free from any kind of judgment or criticism, because once we do this, our attention is no longer here and now in the present moment, but rather it is entangled in that judgment. Secondly, every act of mindfulness involves an inward detachment. To be mindful of my hand, I have to inwardly step back from my hand in order to become aware of it and to become mindful of a thought or a word in my mind, I have to step back in order to observe it. This is especially true when it comes to our being mindful of our emotional state, because we have to detach from our emotions and inwardly step back in order to become aware of what it is we are feeling. And this is one of the reasons it is so therapeutic, because it allows us to get a little less caught up in our life, a little less caught up in the drama. 
And thirdly, it is important to place it in a dialectic and understand mindfulness in opposition or relation to mindlessness. And although this is the state in which we have lived most of our life, like a fish in water, it is hard to see because there is an aspect of obliviousness and a lack of awareness or self-reflectivity to the state. Perhaps you got into a car and drove for miles and realized you had no awareness of the journey, or you went to the kitchen and forgot why, or you just finished reading a page and realized you were not paying attention as your eyes seemed to automatically skip over the words and you had to go back and read it again. Anger and things such as road rage are classic examples where we have lost awareness of ourselves. Or perhaps we were watching a suspenseful movie and didn't even know we were holding our hands so tightly. And so mindlessness can also be equated with a lack of awareness, going through the motions and behaving more like a machine than anything else. Now mindfulness has some powerful benefits for those suffering from borderline personality disorder or BPD, and which are the reasons mindfulness skills are the backbone of dialectical behavior therapy. Firstly, it brings a sense of control and mastery to our lives. Often, when our emotions are running amok and we feel like we are drowning in a storm, the ability to detach by bringing our awareness back to something real, something we can observe right here and now, in this present moment, can be a lifeline. Instead of getting more and more upset and digging ourselves into a deeper hole, learning how to stop and follow the air as it flows in through our nose, nasal cavity, back of mouth, throat, vocal cords, and right down into our lungs, and then trace it back out along this path, can have such a calming effect, especially when we realize how connected our breath really is to our emotional state, and that emotions like anxiety and fear, are in part sustained by rapid, shallow half-breaths where we only breathe from the top half of our lungs and that by consciously and mindfully breathing in such a way that we fill and empty our whole lungs, especially the bottom lobes, can have such a calming effect. Of course, there are many other ways we can use mindfulness skills to help calm stormy emotions. We can do it by really focusing on the sense of touch and the various things we can sense, perhaps mindfully focusing on the sensation beneath our fingertips as we stroke a cat, perhaps the soft silkiness of the hair, or even the subtle reverberations we can sense in our fingertips as the cat purrs or to go outside when it is windy and simply try to be as mindful of the wind as possible, perhaps sensing it blowing against our skin one moment, or really focusing all of our attention on the way it blows through the leaves, causing them to dance in the air. So mindfulness allows us to take more control over our lives especially over our self-destructive behaviors and addictive urges, because it increases our awareness and helps us to gain a greater degree of self-control. Secondly, because mindfulness requires us to be aware of the present moment in a non-judgmental way, it can actually help us to see our judgments and inwardly separate ourselves from those critical thoughts that often support and sustain our emotional storms. Even just learning how to be mindful of the emotion and really focus on feeling it in our body, perhaps in our stomach, shoulders, and face, and separating this from the critical judgments in our minds is often enough to place a tiny wedge 
between the two that will give us the ability to separate them and detach cause from effect. And this also enables us to begin to take control of our thoughts because all too often we ruminate and have thoughts that loop around over and over, spending far too much time rehashing the past in our mind, engaging in the destructive would-haves, should-haves, and could-haves, and catastrophizing, and imagining scenes in the future that will never follow our imagined script. And thoughts such as these can have such a corrosive effect on us, while learning to be more mindful allows us to break free from these dark patterns. And this ties in to an often overlooked aspect of mindfulness, because it is like a muscle that grows stronger the more we exercise it. And this muscle can be used to help us concentrate on things more fully. And so if we study with a mindful awareness, we will be able to focus more and absorb more information than we would if our mind and thoughts remain scattered. Thirdly, one of the main powers of mindfulness lies in its ability to engender what Dr. John Kabat-Zinn calls acceptance and Dr. Marsha Linehan supercharges with the term radical acceptance. And while we discuss this more in the section on distress tolerance, it is worth noting that because mindfulness requires our awareness to come back to this present moment and to help us be here now, one of its offshoots is that it also makes us more accepting of this moment and more able to tolerate whatever the emotional storm is that we have become trapped in. We cannot escape here and now, but simply have to accept it. And this is one of the magical things that happens the more we practice mindfulness, the more accepting and tolerant we grow. Perhaps we are fighting an old fight in our mind and obsessing over the past and something that someone did to us. And then we stop and become mindful of just how shallow our breathing had grown and how clenched our jaw had become. And so we mindfully breathe and mindfully relax the muscles in our face. And even though this does not change the past, it changes our relationship to the past because it makes us conscious of the fact that we are here now in this moment, that we are in our body breathing and that the past is indeed in the past. So mindfulness allows us to live more fully and engage with life in a deeper and more meaningful way. If we go and spend time with some friends and continually replay something that happened to us in our mind, we will not be able to connect with them as fully and just savor the time we spend with them. And finally, mindfulness can help us to develop one of the core skills taught in DBT. And this is to develop what Dr. Marsha Linehan calls the wise mind. Now, Dr. John Kabat-Zinn, when teaching about mindfulness, refers to what he calls the beginner's mind, which is the need to approach the world with childlike eyes when practicing mindfulness. And so rather than bringing all of our thoughts and associations to bear and looking at the world through the lens of our experiences, to instead see it as if it were fresh and new. Dr. Marsha Linehan takes this one step further and says that we need to learn how to perceive things and events through what she terms the wise mind. We have a rational mind that reasons its way to the truth and an emotional mind that feels its way. And if we imagine these two minds as two ends of a stick, the midpoint where we can balance between the two of them 
is where we find the wise mind. Here, we validate both our feelings and our ability to be rational and use reason, metaphorically using our heart and our head to make sense of things and events and make wise choices. Another metaphor are our eyes. We can close one eye and see out the other, but when we do, we lose our ability to perceive depth. Another metaphor is stereo music, where strings may be played through one speaker and woodwind instruments through another. If we listen to it in mono, they get jumbled together. However, when we separate the tracks and stand between the two speakers, we are able to hear them both from a midpoint in between. The purpose and practice of mindfulness in DBT is to lead us into our wise mind, and it is something we all possess. And so to accomplish this skill, mindfulness training has been broken down into two components, the what skills and the how skills. This means that in order to access our wise minds, what we have to learn to do is to practice three what skills. Observe, describe, and participate. And then also learn to apply the three how skills. A non-judgmental stance, one mindfulness, and effectiveness. Now beginning with the what skills, the first one is observe. And observing is really nothing more than learning how to control our attention and to simply begin noticing things without adding any judgments or commentary and without being attached to what we are observing. It is just noticing things. We can notice what we can see, hear, smell, touch or taste. We can notice our thoughts or feelings. So we should simply observe what we can notice going on inside us or around us or in our environment. And an important concept here is the need to have a Teflon mind so that nothing sticks to it. We simply focus on what we can observe from moment to moment. This leads us to the next what skill. Describe. Just be aware that this one can get a little tricky because we want to have a Teflon mind where nothing sticks and we are simply observing things from moment to moment. However, sometimes, especially when we are new to mindfulness, it helps if we describe with words what we are observing so that our minds do not run away from ourselves and fill with useless chatter and self-talk. Here, very essentials are important and we must refrain from interpreting what we are observing, perhaps quietly saying to ourselves as we observe our stomach and saying inwardly, now I am feeling anxious. Now I am observing my breath. Now I am sensing my fingers, making sure that we do not analyze or attempt to interpret or judge what it is we are observing, but are simply describing our observations as objectively as possible. This leads to the next what skill, participate. When we observe and describe, we are simply becoming mindful of what we can see, hear, smell, taste, touch, think, and feel. We are simply watching our experiences flowing from moment to moment. But we can also more fully experience our experiences. For instance, we can eat while thinking about a conversation we had, or we can mindfully participate in the experience of eating and focus all of our awareness on the fusion of flavors and textures. 
Mindfulness also allows us to live more fully in the present moment and experience it in a deep and profound way. So when we are talking to someone, rather than planning what we are going to say next, we can really become mindful and aware of what the other person is saying and actively listen with our whole being. And so instead of walking down the street conjuring images in our mind of a television program we saw, we can actively participate in the act of walking and mindfully sense how we land on our heels and push off with the ball and toes of our feet. We can mindfully sense the movement of our ankle, knee, and hip joints and really participate and enter into this activity. Then there are the how skills. The first one being a non-judgmental stance. We just mentioned how important it is to maintain a Teflon mind so that nothing sticks to it while we are in a state of mindfulness. This means we should also keep any type of judgment out of our awareness and be objective. So rather than going, rain, ew, now my day will be ruined, we just observe the rain, perhaps how it falls on the ground or the sensation of rain on our head, avoiding any labels such as good and bad. This is especially true when it comes to pain and suffering. Pain is the electric shock we get when our body is filled with static electricity and we touch a metal door handle. Suffering is the fear and dread that can rise up as we reach out for the handle and the memory of the shock and the fear and trepidation this realization invokes. The suffering comes from the commentary an amplification of the pain, the judging of it. And so we must just learn to observe in a non-judgmental way without filtering or amplifying the experience. The next how skill is one mindfulness. Here it is really important, especially for the beginner learning to practice mindfulness, to keep it simple and focus our attention on one thing at a time, to give our breathing our full attention, or to focus fully on the sensation of the bottom of our feet, or to be mindful of the air that touches our face. If we try to become mindful of too many things at once, it is like attempting to juggle without having taken any lessons first. We must accept that our power to be mindful is very limited, and if we try to spread it around too much, it will slip away. So we should just focus our awareness on one thing at a time. We should let go of all distractions, especially distracting thoughts, and bring our attention back to this moment, recognizing that mindfulness is like a muscle and what may seem difficult now will be easier when we have had some time to practice because this is a skill and all skills can be enhanced through proper training. So we must train ourselves to bring our attention back to this moment and focus on doing one thing at a time with all of our attention. So rather than focusing on the food on our plate and the radio in the background and what our boss said, we can simply focus on the movement of our jaw and the fusion of tastes in our mouth as we chew. And then when it is time to scoop up another mouthful with our fork to bring our attention to our hand and fork and the food on the plate, focusing on one thing at a time. The next house skill is effectiveness. And this means we should be focusing on doing what works. And instead of trying to run a marathon at the outset to first learn to walk, we need to focus on doing what needs to be done 
right now, here in this moment. So to really be effective at what we are doing, we must let go of all distractions, judgments, interpretations, and attempt to act as skillfully as we can in this moment, given our resources and capabilities. This means letting go of any kind of pettiness, of thoughts of revenge, or feelings of self-pity, and just act with as much skillfulness as we can here and now in this moment. This also means playing by the rules, focusing on the context, getting rid of any feelings of self-importance and believing we are exceptional and that the rules only apply to others. It means working with life and not against it and to flow with events rather than be at loggerheads with them. This also means being mindful of our objectives and what we hope to achieve by doing what we are doing right now, perhaps to learn or grow or not live such a messy life filled with dark and ruinous entanglements. And sometimes this means getting out of our own way. Now in conclusion, I just want to return to the concept of wise mind. All of the what and how skills involved in mindfulness are meant to lead us into the state where we can access our wise mind. And while we have already spoken about this, there are a few more things we can say. Our wise mind exists at the midpoint between our rational or thinking mind and our feeling or emotional mind. However, to describe it this way is to miss the fact that it is actually more like it is the midpoint behind them. That is, accessing the wise mind involves a metaphorical stepping back and moving inwards. It involves detaching from the surface and stepping back from our thoughts and feelings into something deeper. Imagine an ocean filled with large frothy waves and a diver that dives below the surface to where the water is still clear and calm. They can still see the surface, but with the added perspective that comes with depth. This is why the wise mind opens to intuition and deeper, more meaningful perceptions. We often ignore our feelings and do not listen to what they are really trying to tell us. And so one way to find the wise mind is to focus on our solar plexus and to ask ourselves what it is we are really feeling right here and now in this moment. And what is the message these feelings are trying to send us? Another way to access it is to focus on the center of our forehead, but slightly behind our thoughts and ask ourselves if a particular thought is a judgment or criticism and if it is true or merely something we are projecting. Now just take a final moment and become aware of your breathing. Perhaps become aware of the air as it flows in and out of your nostrils. And then be mindful of the air as it flows in through your nostrils, nose, nasal cavity, back of mouth, throat, vocal cords, and into your lungs. And then remain aware of it as it flows back out past all of these points from your lungs to your nostrils. And then become aware of your whole body breathing, sensing your body from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head sensing your body from side to side, front to back, sensing your body breathing. 